My name is Ryan Leak, and I am just so delighted, humbled, and honored to, to be with you. You know, when Jennifer asked me to come, I was like, you want me? You want me to come? I said, I, I, would, I would be glad to, to do so. And for those of you that are watching online and you can't see everything that's happening in the room, um, I just believe that the adversary of our soul is afraid of rooms like this. A room full of women that are not afraid to worship, a, woman, a, a room full of women that aren't afraid to pray. Uh, you may not have seen this, um, but there was a mom in the balcony pacing. I saw her tearing down strongholds. And so I just believe that there's something that's going to happen today. And I just believe anything can happen when we get together. And I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. But there are so many days where I wake up and I just feel alone. But there's something about walking into the house of God where you just get a little bit more strength. You get a little shot in your arm to, to keep going a little bit. And I, I'm excited today to talk to you a, a, little, bit about, a little bit about failure. Um, as Mo uh, said, my name is Ryan, and uh, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, a couple of things you need to know about me. First thing is I'm married. I believe they have a picture of my wife on one of these mini screens that we have here on the stage. That's, that's my wife, Amanda. Thank you for those few claps. I'm happy about it. Um, some of you might be looking at the screen thinking to yourself, how in the world did he get her? Let me explain. Uh, when me and my wife were dating, she said, she, I overheard her tell a friend she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I was like, what? What does that even mean? And so over the next two years, I began planning our wedding behind her back. So here's how this works. June 7, 2013, I get down on one knee. I say, Amanda, will you marry me? She said, yes. I said, just kidding. Will you marry me today? And she's like, what? And we opened up a lounge room door, and a hundred of our family and friends were standing in there with a the sign that said, today. We rolled in a dress, hairstylist, makeup artist, everything that you would need to get engaged and married on the same day. We were engaged for a real long time, 10 hours, okay? I got no engagement advice for nobody, okay? I didn't know what I was doing. And so, uh, so, we, get, so we got engaged and married on the same day, uh, made a documentary out of it. It's called The Surprise Wedding. You can go and check that out on YouTube after the conference, okay? Don't do it right now, okay? Some of you clicked off and already went off. No, stay with us, okay? Uh, and then... Uh, we immediately started the baby-making process. Now we have two children, and uh, I believe we have a picture of them as well. This is Jackson and Roman. Uh, Jackson's getting ready to turn seven. Roman's two years old. Uh, they are the, uh, they keep life eventful. They're, that is definitely for, for sure. And uh, the number one question that I get whenever it pertains to the surprise wedding is, what about the dress? That's the first question. The second question that I get the most is, what if she said no? And it's a great question, because what was it? It's, it's a risk. And here's what I want every single person under the sound of my voice to know today, that what God is calling us to is often outside our comfort zone, and it's often risky. And sometimes what happens is, is God asks us to do something, and then we calculate the failure rate and then make a decision if we want to say yes. But sometimes we just have to take a step of faith. Sometimes we just have to step outside of our comfort zone. And ever since this wedding, God continues to put me in front of a group of people that have dreams. God continues to put me in front of a group of people that want to step outside of their comfort zone, but sometimes lack the courage to do so. So today, I want to look at somebody in Scripture that struggled with this. I want to look at somebody in Scripture that was given a mission, but felt like the mission was bigger than their life, that was bigger than their past. It was too big for them. And that person is Moses. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said, to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill us as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. 
But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. We're talking about not the famous Moses that most of us know. We're talking about murderer Moses. We're talking about somebody that has done some really, really bad things. We're talking about somebody that has a past and he's extremely tired and he sits down by a well. And what I love about this scripture is that he has found himself in a desert at a well and God meets him in the desert and God meets him at a well and he meets him with the mission, which is not a typical mission that you would give a murderer. And he says, he says this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. He said, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is given a mission, and he gives four responses that I want us to look at this morning. The first response is, who am I? Who am I? I wonder how many of us have asked that question. Who am I to write a book? Who am I to be in a movie? Who am I? And at this point in the sermon, at this point in the message, what I'm supposed to do is tell you who you are. But let's see how God responds. This is how God responds, and I love it. He says, but I will be with you. Wait a minute, God, you should have told Moses, oh, you are my son. You are a child of God. You are a daughter of the Most High. This is who you are. You have to know who you are in Christ. God says, um, this actually ain't even about you. He didn't even answer his question. <laughs> who am I? Tell me who I am. I didn't act to come to encourage you, God says. He goes, I came to let you know I'll be with you. And if I'm with you, that's all you need. I wonder who's here. I wonder who's watching that has had God put something in their heart that they've just discounted and just thought, who am I? What I want to encourage you with is if God is with you, that is all that you need. The second response, because it, it's, it's so, I, I, this is one of my favorite uh, passages because we are actually seeing a man argue with God. Okay, we're, we're seeing God give a plan and we're seeing a man go, Okay, I, I heard what you said, God, but now let me tell you what I think, which is pretty crazy, which is why when we pray our Father in heaven, the key words there are in heaven, because he's giving us a heavenly assignment, and we want to give him our earthly response. So we ought to remember that this is a heavenly God giving us a mission. We might as well just say yes and no, he's going to be with us. But in this argument, the second response is, he says, then... Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Or maybe they would say, aren't you the murderer? Maybe you got some people you went to college with that you're trying to minister to, and they're like, well, you used to party with me. What you talking about? Who? Who? Do you? Some of us are wondering if we have enough credibility to be used by God. But if we wait for somebody else's approval for what God has called us to do, we'll be waiting a very, very long time. And so what God does is he takes them on an experience and starts to show them how to use his staff and starts to show them that, hey, I'm going to give you an experience and do miracles through your life. And once again, your past will not be the credibility. Mine will. It's like using some, it's like somebody else co-signing for a car for you. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes your credit is a little funny, but then you got somebody else that's got the good stuff. That's God. He's going to use, use my credit. We're good. And then we get to this third response. He says, but, but Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. He's going, I don't know that I have the skill set to pull off what it is that you've asked me to do. I know you've been speaking to me about my children, but somehow I just, I'm not really seeing that I'm the person that is equipped to do this. I mean, I, I can't speak for you, but I can certainly speak for myself and my wife. Um, we wake up on a daily basis feeling like 
we are failing as parents. And then uh, the longer I'm a parent, I've yet to meet the person that has said, yo, I'm crushing it as a parent today. <laughs> like, it's like we all get in this boat together where we're just like, we're just not doing enough and the grades are just never good enough and they're not good enough at sports and their clothes don't always match and I forgot to do the laundry. And it's just, this stuff can just pile up on you and as soon as they make one cuss word, you're like, what happened? Is this on me? And then you just start freaking out like, this is, this is my fault, if only, if only, if only. God, I'm not good at this stuff. And then I just, I, I love how God responds. He says, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you will speak. For every single person under the sound of my voice that didn't have a father. For every single person under the sound of my voice that is in a home where they're going. We, we feel this empty space where there's not a man speaking things over us. God will be your father. You want to make sure the word of God is spoken in your home. He's going, hey, I know there's things that you didn't get taught. I know you didn't grow up around people that got money. I know you didn't grow up in a home that, that taught you the things of God. I don't know how to do this church stuff. This is, this is one of my favorite scriptures. God's going, I'll teach you. Stick with me, baby. I, I, I got you. I will show you the way I will be your father. And then Moses, his fourth response is his most honest response. I believe this is probably the most relatable response. He says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> He's like, hey, listen, I, I, I've given you excuses. I know the speech. I know I'm slow with speech, but I, that's really not the excuse. I know I, I'm, a, I'm a murderer and people, I'm, I'm most wanted in, 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 in Egypt. I don't know that I really want to go back there. Um, so I got all these excuses, but if I'm honest with you, God, I don't want to do it. <laughs> she just, my cousin, she good. Like she, she can preach, you should use her, yep. Yeah, this girl over here, she married, like she got, yeah, like her husband got a bunch of stuff going. You should use, you should use her. She's great. I got a couple of people you, I can call for you, Jesus. <laughs> can I, um, as a person that gets to teach the scripture very often, what I'm, what I'm enjoying more and more as I dive into the scripture is almost every single person that God chooses is someone you and I would never pick on our team. From the disciples to Moses to Paul, every single one of them, you're like, Jesus, you're trying to change the world. Why would you pick Judas? This makes no sense to me. You could have picked John the Baptist. He was, that would have been a good player to be on your team. How are you making sense of that? Like your squad isn't making sense. But that's the point of the scripture. Is that every single time that we feel disqualified, God's going, can you see that I continuously use disqualified people to flip the world upside down and flip your home upside down? So I'll take you unqualified. Some of us believe that God can't use us until he fixes us. What would you do if I told you God could use you just as you are, if you would just surrender it to him? Please send someone else. I refuse to let you abort the mission and purpose God has put on your life. It's not for somebody else. It's for you. And I love God's response. It says, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you never want to be in a position where the anger of the Lord is kindling against you. Okay, that's, that's a bad day, okay? But then, Jesus, but then God says this, he says, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and teach you both what to do. 
He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Well, God says, he's going, hey, I know you think that what I've called you to do is only about you, but I'm going to send some help. No single mom walks alone. If you have a dream that God has put in your heart and you're the only one in it, I might question if it's a God dream. Because there should be somebody else in that dream with you. And you want to know what I love about what happens in the next couple of verses? Is the scripture tells us that God actually goes out to Aaron after he already told Moses that Aaron was on his way, which means a couple of things. There's a couple of ways we could look at this scripture. Either A, um, God is not confined by time, so he can go into the future and into the past and know what's going to happen and be able to speak on both ends, which is very, very God-like. Secondly, maybe he just trusted Aaron that he knew what he would do. Maybe Aaron had lived a life that was so faithful, he says, I can count on him, that no matter what I ask him to do, He'll do it. So then God goes to meet Aaron in the desert and says, hey, I got this guy. He don't even want to do it, but I'm going to make him. So can you join forces with him? For some of us, it's not even about what God has called us to do. It's about who God has called us to, to come alongside to say, we're supposed to be in this thing together. It's easy for us always to see ourselves as Moses in the story, somebody's got to be Aaron. Somebody's got to be an associate. Somebody's got to. Did you know that perhaps there are some strengths that God has put in you that can be a supplement to the weakness of, of another leader? What if you're supposed to come alongside somebody? What if that's your child? That you said, you know what? I'm just supposed to do my job with this child and let God take care of of the rest. I have to wonder what our lives would look like if we weren't afraid to say yes to God. Um, as um, a part of the surprise wedding, um, it went viral. It has about 1.4 million views on YouTube. And uh, we got to go on Good Morning America, the Today Show, and then we got to go on the Queen Latifah Show. Hey. And so um, on the Queen Latifah Show, uh, they had a producer come back and they said, hey, uh, the queen's going to ask you three questions. We're like, okay, great. So we kind of practiced the deal. Well, while we're filming it live, uh, Queen Latifah goes for a fourth question to my wife. And she says, hey, Amanda, do you think that you could surprise Ryan the same way that he surprised you? She says, yeah, I think I can. I think you can. What we, what we going to do? Is Denzel Washington here? Where is he at? <laughs> what, what, like, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what the equivalent would be. My wife looks at me. She says, Ryan. Me and the queen, I said, you and the queen, y'all just met. We met at the same time. How are you on a first name basis with Queen Latif? <laughs> she said, with me and the queen, we're working on a little surprise for you, so why don't you go ahead and check out this video? So I look at, to the back of the studio, and on the screen comes um, a guy by the name of Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant says, hey, Ryan, um, I immediately peed on Queen Latifah's couch. I said, this is crazy. <laughs> and being the preacher that I am, I started breaking down his words like it was Greek and Hebrew. I said, he said, hey! which is an American greeting that friends use from one another. He said, Ryan, that's me, which means me and Kobe Bryant must be friends. What is happening right now? He said, Ryan, I heard about this extravagant wedding that you pulled off for your wife and wanted to just invite you to Staples Center and to come hang out with me and the Lakers, and the invitation has been formally extended to you. You picked the game. I looked at my wife. I said, you are winning. This is amazing. <laughs> so I had three months to prepare to meet Kobe Bryant. So what I naturally would do is, number one, I started practicing my greeting in the shower. Hey, Kobe. Ryan, why is your voice so deep? What's wrong with you? <laughs> hey, Kobe, what are you, 12? Grow up. I'm like, all right, get, get your stuff together. All right, what are we going to wear? Because you got to be geared. Do I come in all purple or all gold? No, Ryan, we're normal clothes. We're normal clothes like a normal person. Do I ask for an autograph? No, he should ask me for my autograph. Ryan, what's wrong with you? What are you, what are you telling him? You telling him you're a motivational speaker? Kobe Bryant don't need no motivation. You tell him you're a filmmaker? He live in Hollywood. Everybody a filmmaker. I'm like, I'm losing. I'm like, I don't know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> then I said, you know what? I think we would have an intriguing conversation if I was in the NBA. Now, 
You may not be able to tell watching online or the depth perception from where you are sitting. I am 6'3", very good at basketball, played in college at North Central University, and I was an All-American. That might sound impressive right now, but what you should know is that North Central University is a D3-ish school. What does that mean? Um, we weren't in the NCAA, we were in the NCCAA, which stands for National Christian College Athletics Association, which simply means amongst Christians, I'm very good. Church League MVP all day. But after that, we got to chill out. All right, buddy, just be cool. So, uh, but I never pursued the pro. I never, I never tried. I, I assumed I would fail. So I just started doing something else. I said, oh, I'm going to use my business degree. I'm going to go into ministry. I'm going to do both. I'm, I'm going to just... I'm gonna just do something else. And I thought, but you know what? Every now and then I'll go to a game. And I'll be like, I can play with these dudes. I could, I could, I could. He did that wrong. If he would have just, if he would have just, I said, you know what? I'm gonna go for it. So I started getting back in all American shape. Oh, I was eating good. I, I, I was doing everything. And then one of my friends got cut from the Chicago Bulls and he came back to Dallas and we started training together. I'm 6'3, about 205. He's 6'5, 245. A little bit of a gap. And so we started playing one-on-one, -on -one, played five games. He beat me 11 to six every single time. So there was a clear margin. He's not even NBA good enough. And I'm like NCCAA, okay? So I'm like, this is not a great idea. And I went, but I'm, I'm gonna fail. You know, Ryan, go to, go to California and meet Kobe Bryant like a normal person, shake his hand, take a picture and go home. <laughs> but then I thought, Ryan, how do you know you're gonna fail? You've never tried. And I had this sense in my spirit that God didn't want me to be in the NBA, but I had this sense that God wanted me to try. He wanted to do something. I, I couldn't see it at the time, but I was just like, all right. So that was the day that a chasing failure project was birthed. So I just started asking people, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do? People started telling me all types of crazy stuff. Like, Ryan, what would you do? I'm like, I mean, if I couldn't fail, I'd be in the NBA. So when I met Kobe Bryant, I said, hey, Mr. Bryant, I'm a filmmaker. I'm making a new film called Chasing Failure. I'm gonna ask a lot of people, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And he's like, it's a great message. Everybody in America needs to hear that message. I said, Kobe, don't be trying to steal my stuff, man. Okay, it's my idea. Don't, don't, listen, I shouldn't have made you sign an NDA, but I'm being nice to you right now. And then I realized I didn't tell him I was gonna try and be in the NBA. I was like, well, so, um, I'm going to be in the NBA. He was like, yeah, do it. I'm like, so we're just going to go with the Nike slogan today? That's all we, you just do it? That's all you got? He's like, yeah, do it. I'm like, but you were supposed to tell me how hard it is. You were supposed to give me all the reasons not to do it. You were actually supposed to discourage me. He's like, why would I do that? Just do it. So I, I, I'm like, I've had my moment. I've got my picture, and I'm just thinking, Okay, we had the conversation, that's great. You know, let me just go ahead and slip out this room. Some other Make-A-Wish kids came in. I was like, man, bless these kids. Man, all right, Kobe, I'm gonna holler at you for a second. He said, hey, right. I said, yeah, Mr. Bryant. He said, make sure you send me that documentary. Is this where we supposed to exchange phone numbers? Do you want my people to call your people? I ain't got no people, so I'm gonna just call your people. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So now that Kobe Bryant's checking his phone every day waiting for a documentary, now I actually have to figure out how to like get an NBA workout. For those of you that don't understand how the National Basketball Association works, it's not a church league, you don't just get to sign up. Um, you need to be invited. You need to play at like a Division I school like LSU, North Carolina, Duke, not NCCAA, okay? Like you, you need, like there's a, a, a procedure and protocol to being one of the top 450 basketball players in the world. So what I did is what we all do when we don't know what to do. I Googled it, and what I found was the public relations emails for every NBA team, and I just started emailing them one by one. Started with the Boston Celtics. I said, hey, uh, my name's Ryan Leake, Chase and Failure. Uh, I believe you've got Celtics fans all across the city that are afraid to fail, and I don't think they should be. Can you imagine if we took their dreams off the shelf together? Here's the deal. I want to work out for your basketball team. I'll probably fail, but what if I don't? There's only one way for us to find out, and that's for you to let me try. Sincerely, Ryan Lee. It sounds confident today, 
But when I was typing it, I was like, oh my God, Jesus, help me, Lord Jesus. I was speaking in tongues, like, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. This feels illegal. Is the FBI going to come arrest me for getting these emails? I don't know what's going to happen. So I hit sin, closed it, and ran to lunch as fast as I could. <laughs> 30 minutes later, the Boston Celtics wrote back, and they said, Ryan, love this idea. It's just not for us. Best of luck in your future endeavors. I thought, <laughs> rejection, failure, the thing that we're all afraid of. But then I thought, did the Boston Celtics just email me back? Like, what'd you do today? Like, this is amazing. <laughs> so then I, I get hyped. I'm like, yo, I'm about to make a documentary on being told no by all 30 NBA teams, and you all are going to feel so bad for me, depressed at my laptop. And yeah, I got so happy about no's. I got told no by the Clippers. I got told no by the Timberwolves. I, would, I emailed Nike. I said, hey, I've already given you half of my life savings, so... <laughs> It'd be great if y'all could send something back. I'm, I'd love to work out in your gear. They're like, email John. So I emailed John. John's like, what's your shirt size, shoe size, short size? Send me everything. I was like, all right. Two days later, $2,000 worth of Nike gear showed up at my house. I said, I love failure. Failure is awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> and, and slowly but surely, I just stopped being afraid. I just was just like, all they can tell me is, no, and I'd be in the exact same position I was in the day before. Except there was one problem on the fifth email to the Phoenix Suns. They said, yeah, we love this idea. Come on Monday. I said, this Monday? They said, yeah, bring your camera crew. I said, camera crew? Yes, camera crew. Anybody doing a documentary obviously has... A camera crew, duh. I'll be there on Monday. I ain't had no camera crew. I had a dude named Chuck from the church. <laughs> so this is a Friday. I say, hey, Chuck, man, I ain't got time to explain everything to you right now, man, but we got to get on a plane. We got to go to Phoenix. It's going to be fun. He said, man, what are we doing in Phoenix? I said, dude, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. So I'm trying out for the Phoenix Suns. He said, Ryan, you the young adults pastor at the church. You ain't, you ain't trying out for no Phoenix Suns. Ryan, what are we really doing in Phoenix? Speaking at a youth conference? No, nah, man, I'm trying out for the Phoenix Suns. He says, you think that the Phoenix Suns are going to let us walk into the gym, let me film you playing basketball for two days? Hey, man, that's what Julie said on the phone. I don't know, but we got to go find out. <laughs> the next crazy conversation was with my pastor. I said, hey, uh, hey, man, you know that Tuesday meeting we got? I ain't going to beat her. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Phoenix. He said, you speaking in Phoenix? No. Nah. <laughs> playing basketball. He said, you going to who? I said, man, here's the deal, man. I'm doing this documentary called Chasing Failure. I didn't want to talk to you about it because you ain't trying to fail. And so I'm like, I, I, it was, it's, it's confusing. All right, I'm in the middle of it right now. It don't make sense right now, but it's going to make sense one day. But I got to go to Phoenix to find out if it makes sense at all. This could be the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life or awesome. We're going to find out. He's like, so you mean to tell me my young adults pastor at the time, he's like, my young adults pastor is flying to Phoenix to travel for the Phoenix Suns. I said, that's right. He says, well, what happens if you make the tent? I'm going to quit, duh. Would you think I'm going to stay here, talk to these young adults for $30,000 a year? I'd go make a million dollars. You crazy. I'll stream to these kids. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but don't worry. I'll fail, okay? I'll be here Wednesday. All right, everybody just calm down. Um, you get to go home and watch two documentaries, The Surprise Wedding and Chasing Failure. A spoiler alert, I failed. That's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> But something happened in Phoenix that I don't think could happen in Dallas. Because I swear they were trying to kill me. They were trying to make a point. Uh, at one point, we're doing this drill. And uh, they said, you have to get down and back 30 times in three minutes. Y'all should go try it after this and just tell me how it is, OK? It's, trust me. It's, it's no joke. You have to cover the entire 94 feet in six seconds, 30 times. I did it in the first 90 seconds. But then that last 90 seconds, I hit every kind of wall you can think of. Mentally, I lost it. Spiritually, I didn't even know where my soul was. <laughs> my back went out. I, I just, I lost everything. I hit every kind of wall you can hit. It's a question in my life. I'm like, is this how my life ends? Is this how we gonna go out? And, I've, and I brought a cameraman to film my most embarrassing moment ever. This is the dumbest idea you've ever had. And so at this point, I'm literally just kangarooing down the court because I can't run anymore. And as I'm kangarooing up and down the floor, I find myself going past this logo. 
Normally, the logos that I'm running past are the YMCA logo, Lifetime Fitness logo, 24-Hour Fitness logo, Church League logo. But on this particular Monday afternoon, it was the Phoenix Suns logo. And I asked myself this question, Ryan, how in the world did you get here? And I realized something. Chasing failure took me further than chasing success ever did. Because I, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm shooting emails. I'm calling Chuck. And I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Lord, what in the world are you trying to do? And before you know it, you just look back and you've taken so many steps so far outside the comfort zone. You're like, well, Lord, here we are. And I just believe that if you are not afraid to fail, you will look back on your life a year from now and two years from now. And you'll say, look how far the Lord has brought me. I don't believe the Lord wanted me to be in the NBA. I believe he wanted me to try because the fear of failure was broken off of my life in Phoenix, Arizona. So now I tell people to act a fool. People tell me the craziest stuff. I'm like, you got to do it. They're like, you think I, you think I can make it? No. <laughs> Not at all. But if you don't, I don't know if you will grow closer to the Lord. Because I think each and every one of us should be doing something that requires us to fall to our knees. And you know what I couldn't see at the time? Is now I'm invited to speak to NBA teams. So I'm still in the NBA, but what I've figured out over the last five years is there's more than one way to be in the NBA. Here's the other thing I found out. I'm a better communicator than I am basketball player. And that's okay. Some of us are so afraid of, some of us think, it's got to be perfect before I move forward with it. It's never going to be perfect. Thank God that he uses human beings and not just superheroes. Thank God he uses single moms. Where in the world would we be without you? I came to encourage somebody in Baton Rouge. Don't be afraid to fail. And trust that if God is with you and he's put it in your heart, it's his job to resource you to make it happen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every single mom under the sound of my voice. I thank you for every single parent, every single volunteer, every single pastor. And God, I ask that you would give us the courage to obey whatever it is that you've asked us to do. May we not try to play God and come to conclusions about your plan for us. May we just play our part and just say yes to whatever it is that you've called us to do. May we believe for crazy things. May we believe for miracles through our children. And may we trust you with the process despite our history, despite where we come from, despite our insecurities, despite our flaws and our failures. May we just move forward knowing that you are with us all along and it's more about the journey with you than it is the destination. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody sit.